something in English. You know? And that's another thing, that, that the chants, you know, it's very good to chant in a foreign language, because then your left brain is not tempted to think about things, about the concepts. And that's why it's helpful, I think, for a lot of Jewish people to, to learn some Buddhist chant or Hindu chant and so forth, because you're not thinking it out. You're not getting in a debate. And part of the Jewish tradition is debating, and it's a great tradition. But um, sometimes you have to shut that brain down a bit and go this other direction. But I mean, your question is very poignant. I mean, that we even have to ask it. It reminds me of a story two years ago or so, two or three years ago, I got a call from a journalist in LA, and she said she's doing an article on the biggest youth prison in America, which is in LA or outside LA. And she said, um, she said, it's interesting because they, they were so desperate. There was so much violence and all this. They brought in three Buddhist monks to teach these young kids uh, to meditate. And she said, um, the first few weeks, they were saying, what's meditation? Who are you? Why are you dressed like that? Blah, blah, blah. Then they just got into it. And she said, this amazing thing happened. The whole prison. <laughs> started doing meditation, and it just shifted the entire energy of the place. Now she said, I'm writing an article, but the point is this, she said, 95% of the prisoners are Christian. They're either Baptist or Roman Catholic, i.e. black or Latino. And she said, they're asking, is there such a thing as Christian meditation? You know, do we have to learn this from monks, from Buddhist monks? Well, there was such a thing as Christian meditation, but a lot of it's been lost. And um, not lost in the sense that it can't be recovered, but I mean it's been ignored. And um, um, that's what, again, what we've been trying to do in our programs and, and myself and in a lot of the research and writings I've been doing is finding out what are the, for example, there's this wonderful book on Jesus, I, I presume I recommend it, that's a Rabbi Jesus by Bruce Chilton. He has found the meditation that John the Baptist taught Jesus and that Jesus taught his disciples. And it's a meditation on, a, on uh, Ezekiel 1, the chariot meditation. And in Jewish tradition, this is a meditation that makes you a prophet. It's a very powerful meditation. And um, if you'd like, we could actually do that sometime. And I, I've done it with groups where we, it's a chant, you see. And you get into the chanting thing of it, and things happen to people, you know. It, <laughs> it opens your mind up, you know, more than that. It opens your psyche up. And, it's, and it's, it has this powerful morphic resonance, this powerful history. Wow, this was a meditation that radicalized Jesus and kept him going his whole life, and he taught his disciples that it got him all in trouble. Hey, this can't be all bad, you know. <laughs> so um, I highly recommend it. You know, you could go to Ezekiel 1, the last part of the chapter, and it's about the fiery wheel. It, it's amazing that we wandered so far from the experiential dimension of religion that we have to ask these questions, you know. Um, but it's great that we're asking them, and at, to ask is to demand, you know. You know, to ask this question is to, well, literal, let's get this house in order here. Because I, as I'm sure I mentioned last time, you know, I'm convinced our species isn't gonna survive without learning to calm down the reptilian brain, which is what meditation does. So we gotta come up with forms. And of course, today we're, we're blessed. There's so many forms available. Uh, from so many traditions. In fact, we're almost over, <laughs> over blessed. You have to find out what works for you at this time in your life. Now you see, the rosary in the Catholic Church, which comes from Islam, Dominic was a Spaniard and he stole the idea from the Muslims. But, uh, and of course they stole it from the Indians in India, so you know, it's, it's, but the mantra, you see, it's a mantra. The rosary is a mantra and the whole point is to numb your left brain because mysticism is engaging the engagement of your right hemisphere of your brain. So you numb that by this repetition of the rosary, and then you go into an altered state. So that's the real meaning behind the rosary. Now, the truth is that the 16th century version of the rosary, they, the Pope in the 16th century added the ending, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Notice, sin and death, the fear of death, that was added in the 16th century. The 12th century Hail Mary doesn't have that in it at all. It's not about the fear of death, and it's not about sin. In fact, it's about glory. It has a phrase that ends with the phrase that we share the glory of the angels, because Mary has shown us the way and so forth. So it's a 
a much more delicious and creation-centered mantra than what is current. It's so interesting that you say that, because when I say the rosary, I get filled with awe, and then I get crashing down, and it's, it's been a, a struggle. It's like I just don't want to do it. And I, start, and I started trying to recreate it in my own words, Good. That, that, that. which was great. But, That's what you but that was that struggle was like, Oh, you know, pray for a sinner. Yeah. It's like, there, here we go. There we go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's 16th century, and you see, it's not just Calvin and Luther who were pessimistic in the 16th century. The Catholic Church was too. So what was the 12th century? The 12th century Church? was so different. <laughs> That's why I'm flying tomorrow to chart to talk about the 12th century Renaissance. Well, then, and I could share the 12th century uh, whole very <laughs> with you. In fact, it's a beautiful, it's sung, it's sung too, it's just beautiful. But, um, the whole 12th century, you see, was the uh, influx of the gods. And the goddess, remember, uh, Marija Gamutas, the great feminist archaeologist, says the essence of the goddess civilization was the celebration of life. That was the essence of it. The via positiva, everything we've been talking about tonight. And this came about in the 12th century. There was a huge awakening to the celebration of life. And of course, architecturally, now Adorant, the great Adorant, says, if you want to know the soul of a culture, go to its architecture first. So the, the shift from the Romanesque squat, think of Mont Saint-Michel, you know, defensive uh, architecture of the what we call the Dark Ages, the feudal ages. You know, the fact is that Europe was very cold in what we call the Dark Ages. And part one reason they had thick walls was to keep them warmer, which is fine, but I, I have a thesis that all culture is determined by the weather anyway. <laughs> and the fact is that Europe warmed up in the 12th century. And the result was that you had a longer growing period. Therefore, you had larger families. Having larger families, they couldn't keep them down on the farm. There wasn't enough work in the feudal system on the farm. So you only had villages. You only had no real cities until the 12th century. Then the young people left the farm because they couldn't get work. They fluttered in the cities. They created these cities. They created the university. They created the cathedra, the cathedral. And it was, and the goddess ruled over the, the cathedral and the university. And it was the last time that the goddess was front and center in Western civilization. That's why what's happening today is so exciting and potentially a renaissance, potentially so. Because, it brings with it, the goddess brought with her then, this incredible awakening to scholarship, to wisdom, even to sexuality. You know, for 125 years in the 12th and up to the mid-13th century, as John Baswell has pointed out, homosexuality was not condemned by the church. In fact, it was taught in the university. It wasn't taught as a science, but the, the reading of gay literature was, was an integral part of the curriculum in the early periods of the university, the late 12th and early 13th century. And in fact, the Bishop of Chartres, who built Chartres, the first Gothic cathedral, was gay. So um, homophobia has not always ru ru ruled in Western Christianity. And in fact, this was the most creative time in the Western Christianity, the 12th, early 13th century. And uh, it was also a time that, of tolerance and acceptance of diversity. So again, I think that um, there are parallels in, uh, in, in our time, too. Um, and, and where there aren't, we have to make them happen. <laughs> because uh, I think that there's no question in my mind that pessimism, you know, they did studies of, Kore of uh, prisoners of war in the Korean War, American prisoners of war. And, and you can kill yourself out of despair. That they found that pr some prisoners just went to bed one night and died. And these were the prisoners who were most in despair. So there's no question that the human heart needs to be a positiva, to survive. And not just the individual heart, but a community. A community that cannot unite around joy and awe is, is no longer a community. It's just everyone fighting for their piece of the pie. Because, and this is where ritual is, has such an important role to play too. Ritual is supposed to be the gathering of the joy of a community, not the gathering of the literate ones reading prayers out of books at each other. But the explosion and the sharing of joy, but also the taking into grief, you know, dealing with the deep stuff. 
the via positiva, and as we'll talk about two weeks from today, the via negativa. If we're not doing that in our ritual, and frankly, we're not in most rituals in the West today, we're, 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 we're dried up. As Bella Domisomi, the African Spirit teacher, says, without ritual, there's no community. So the, the need for community is, is, um, is going to bring ritual alive today, as it did in the 12th century. Because believe me, when they, when they recreated the architecture from Romanesque to Gothic, not only was Gothic about light and about color, they invented the stained glass. Just as today we've invented the video and the fractals and all of these amazing um, dancing images out of Silicon Valley right here. And my whole work with the Cosmic Mass for nine years has been to bring that invention of postmodern language into the world of worship in order to resacralize our communities. And um, uh, we'll be talking about that later in, in, in this class, about the implications of, of, of worship and all this. And worship, in many ways, has to carry the whole thing. School's not going to carry it. Worship is what traditionally, uh, ritual or ceremony is what traditionally carries the generations together. It gets the older ones, the elders, and the young ones working together. And that's what we find with our cosmic mass, using the postmodern language of rave and dance and multimedia and electronic music, along with live music and rap and all these new art forms. You, you find a vessel for that, and believe me, energy returns. And with that energy, then you're overcoming the acedia. And I think we talked about this last time. Acedia is so prevalent that we have a word for it, couch potatoitis. We had to invent a new word for it in our culture because it's so, it's so everywhere. We've got to do something about the acedia. That's where the via positiva comes in. It cuts acedia off at the, at the knees. It, it brings energy back. And with that, anything can happen. You can have a renaissance. And today, of course, the Renaissance has to be global. It's not going to be a Western Renaissance, Renaissance, Eastern Renaissance, or Christian Renaissance, or Atheist Renaissance. It's going to be a species Renaissance. And it's, Renaissance means a rebirth of civilization based <coughs> on a common spiritual vision and initiative. And clearly, we're coming to some common issues today. The issue of, of, of eco-justice. And other forms of justice, that's our common agenda today. So, our time's up. I'll see you in two weeks, and we'll be dealing with the via negativa, okay? Great. Thank you. <clears throat>